Let's turn into our Bibles to the book of Joel, Joel chapter 2, and we're going to start with verse 19. Joel chapter 2 and verse 19. Way of an introduction, we'll start with verse 18. The Bible says, Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. Now, though Israel must go through the tribulation period, known in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, as the time of Jacob's trouble, God will save his people. And the Bible continues in Jeremiah's prophet, but he shall be saved out of it. Now, when you study the last days and when you study prophecy of the last days, there are a lot of things that are pretty discouraging to read about. It's not a pretty time. It's not a good time. It's a time of God's, not God's mercy and grace, but God's wrath and God's rage. A lot of times God pours out upon the world his, his judgment. In fact, through the book of Revelation, there are three series of judgments, of seven judgments, seven sealed judgments, seven trumpet judgments, seven bowl or seven bowls of wrath judgments. And what we can see, beloved, is very simple, that this is not a pretty time, but it does conclude on a good note, and that's what we're going to see tonight. The Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord is zealous for Israel because they are his people and it is his land. Joel 2.8 declares that Israel is indeed his land. Doesn't belong to the United Nations. Doesn't belong to the Arabs. Doesn't belong to the Vatican. Doesn't belong to anyone. It belongs to God. It's God's land. That's why it's called the Holy Land. Though there's not a lot of holiness going on in it, but the truth of it is it is called God's holy land because it is his. Now Israel also is his people. Not only are that it is his land, but it is also his people. And here in verse 18 of Joel chapter 2, we see that the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. So let's take a look at the time in a weary time of darkness where there is hope. Oh, the Bible says if we can just hold on to the end, you'll be saved. That's what Jesus told the, the Jewish men and women and the people who believed in Jesus during the time of the tribulation. If you can just hold on to the end, you'll be saved. Let's start with verse 19 and we'll go through verse 27. We see, first of all, a time of rescue. In verse 19, the Bible says, The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations, but I will reprove far from you the northern army, or excuse me, I will remove far from you the northern army, and will drive him away into a barren, desolate land, with his face toward the eastern sea and his back toward the western sea. His stench will come up and his foul odor will rise because he has done monstrous things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field, for the open pastures are springing up and the tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he has caused the rain to come down from you, the former rain, the latter rain, in the first month. The threshing floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten the crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. 
The Bible says here in verses 19 through 27, it's a time of rescue. But though the whole world seems like it's absolutely on fire, when it seems like the whole world is full of destruction and war, the Bible likens it to a, a huge invasion of, of locusts who come and take the land and strip the trees and strip the land and tear up everything. Satan is going to have his way with the world in those seven years of tribulation. And we're going to see what a world without God's touch is going to be like. The world will finally have their desire of the nations, and that is to be rid of God's influence in their lives. Those people will be destined for hell. Oh, what a tragedy in their life. But there is hope. There is hope. At the end of the seven years, there is hope. We see a future deliverance in verse 19 and 20. In verse 19, we see a renewal of the earth. The locusts have come. They've destroyed the earth. The Bible says over a third of the earth will be destroyed just in the first half of the tribulation period. Oh, that's probably going to be a lot of atomic warfare. There's going to be a lot of, of battles being done there that's going to destroy the land. God will one day restore it. We see his provision of plenty. He says, I will send you, he says. He said, I will send you. That's God's provision of a future time of plenty. Oh, when everything seems like it'll never go back to normal, when everything seems like it's never going to be the same, God will come and will restore the whole earth. He will make it anew. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 11 and 12, if you'll turn there, keep your ribbon here in Joel, turn a little bit to your left, uh, to the book of, of, uh, of Jeremiah. A little bit to the left. You go past Daniel, you go past Ezekiel, and there is Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. We're going to look at verse 11 and 12. We see God's provision of a future time of plenty. The Bible says in verse 11, For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of one stronger than he. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, streaming to the goodness of the Lord for wheat and new wine and oil, for the young of the flock and their herd, their souls shall be like a well-watered garden, and they shall sorrow no more at all. We see texts like this, that they will sorrow no more, talking about Israel's being, go, uh, being put into the world, dispersed into the world, sorrowing and having them turn upon them. They'll sorrow no more, speaking of the kingdom yet to come. Back in jo uh, Joel chapter 2, we see his proclamation of promise. In verse 19, the Bible says, I will no longer make you a reproach. The Bible again says in verse 19, I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. You see, God removed their reproach in verse 17. Look at verse 17. The Bible says, let the priest who minister in the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage a reproach that the nation should rule over them. Why should they say among the people, where is their God? God says, I want you to call for me. I want you to turn to me, and I says, I'll remove your reproach. And so in verse 19, uh, we see the renewal of the earth. When the kingdom comes... At the end of the seven years of tribulation, everything will be restored. The earth will be restored. The trees, the fresh waters, the oceans, all of this will all be restored once more. In fact, the Bible says even the animals will be restored. They'll be made like the animals in the kingdom, right like they were in the Garden of Eden. The lion shall lay down with the lamb, the Bible says. A child will play with an asp. A poisonous snake, have no fear of playing with poisonous snakes because there will be no biting there. 
And so we see it'll be a time God will remove their reproach. After the great tribulation will come the great triumph. God will restore the world as if it were in the beginning of time. In verse 20, we see a removal of the enemy. But I will remove far from you the northern army and will drive him away into a barren and desolate land with his face toward the eastern sea and his back toward the western sea. His stench will come up and his foul odor will rise because he has done monstrous things. In verse 20, we see the vanquished. The Antichrist and his armies will all be vanquished. The battle of Armageddon is basically a threefold plan. It's a threefold phase. It starts out with Jesus assembling with the Jewish men and women there, that remnant of two million, perhaps two million Jewish people there in the uh, place called Petra. And he'll go down there in that place that was prepared for them by God, and they will receive him as their Lord and Savior. And he will rescue them from the army that has been sent by the Antichrist to attack them. And therefore, we will see them. They'll be toward the Eastern Sea, the Sea of uh, the, the Dead Sea. And then we see that also he goes up to Jerusalem, and there he takes care of all the armies that are literally occupying Jerusalem, and he destroys all of them. And then he goes north up into what is called Harmagedon, or what we call Armageddon. It is the Valley of Jezreel, the mountain of Megiddo. And there he will go and fight the army of the Antichrist and destroy it there by the Western Sea, the Mediterranean Sea. And the Bible says the vanquished will be there, the Antichrist and his armies. He'll destroy those who followed the Antichrist, who came to destroy the Jewish people, to take the city of Jerusalem as their capital, take it for their world, take it for their God, the Antichrist, who will demand worship as God. He'll take over the temple. He'll establish a, a uh, uh, the, the false prophet will establish an image of him in the, tab in the, in the temple. And there they will sit in the tab uh, temple as God. But he will destroy him and destroy his armies. And then we see the victor, the Lord Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords, will come. He'll come and bring us with him. We will be on white horses with him. Boy, there's going to be a lot of white horses. You think about all the thousands and thousands of, of uh, uh, Christians who have died, gone home to be with the Lord, and ones that will be caught up in the rapture. I tell you, we're all going to be riding on white horses. You know, I tell you, my father-in-law, I went by the Myers. They got that little horse you put a penny in, and I saw that. And my father-in-law said, I, I should uh, uh, ride that little horse and get ready to go come back with Jesus. Well, the bottom line is simple, beloved. We'll be ready. We'll be ready to come back with him. And we'll come and rule and reign with him. It'll be a world beyond any world that this world has ever seen. It'll be a world full of love and joy and peace. We see in verses 21 through 27, a future delight. This world is going to be different. We see in verse 21 and 22, a season of rejoicing. The Bible says, fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field, for the open pastures are springing up, and the trees bear its fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Fig tree and the vine, again, a picture of, of the Jewish people and the Jewish land. We see here that Jesus is going to take the land and make it anew. Now he's going to have to. Folks, all the oceans, most of the oceans are going to be fouled. All the fresh, all the fresh water will be, will be poisoned. A third of the world will be destroyed. More than likely through through atomic warfare. If so, Jesus is going to just remove all that radiation and all that stuff that causes it not to be able to, to be used. And he'll heal the land, literally. So we see a refreshing, in verse 21, of creation. He's going to come and take the scars of mankind's sin off of it. Oh, beloved, you think about it. When the fall came there, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. And the Bible talked about thorns and thistles coming up, that Adam would have to work by the sweat of his brow. 
when we see the kingdom come, the world will be healed. Will be healed. Folks, there won't be any more thorns or thistles or no more radiation and no more of poisoned waters, no more poisoned oceans. A refreshing of all creation. And then in verse 22, there's a rejoicing of the creatures. We see in verse 22, the Bible says, and the, the trees bear its fruit, and then the fig tree and its vines. It said, don't be afraid, you beasts of the field, for the open pastures are springing up. You'll have plenty to eat. Oh, folks, the lion will lay down and eat grass like he used to in the Garden of Eden. Oh, the great, the great beasts of, uh, the, the great beasts of slaughter will be just as tame as a kitten. They'll be just as tame as a little puppy. So we see that these beasts of the field, he's saying, don't be afraid. And the tree, the fig tree and the vine will yield their strength. That means the Jewish nation will once more come into its own. So we see a season of rejoicing. People will begin to rejoice when they see this. Though even though the kingdom, when it ends, it doesn't end in a pretty scene. But we see in the beginning throughout all the kingdom, there is a great time of rejoicing. In verse 23 through 27, a season of renewal. You see, during the time of the tribulation period, there won't be a time of rejoicing. There will be great slaughter. There will be uh, people from all over, a fourth of the people, the population of the world, again, in the first half of the tribulation will be killed, billions of people. We will see that, that the world will be messed up. It will just be absolutely uh, torn up. So we see the season of renewal, the renewal of the land in verse 23 through 25. The Bible says, Be glad then, you children of Zion, the Jewish people, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Oh, that means that the crops will continue to come back. That means they'll be able to to go back to agriculture, be back sowing the land and planting the seed and seeing a great revival of, of the, of the land come back to life. There'll be wonderful crops. There'll be wonderful harvests. We see the renewal of the land. In verse 26 and 27, we see the return of the Lord. The Bible says, you shall eat, which I send them, uh, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be put to shame. Now see that term, that my people shall never be put to shame, is, a, is talking about the kingdom. That my people will never be put to shame, meaning that they will come to know Christ. They'll come to know God. They'll come to live for him, and their whole kingdom will be established by believers. Now, for a thousand years, people will be giving birth to those children and, and uh, um, uh, generations of children who are born into this world with an old nature in them. There'll be sin in the world, but there'll be a world of with Jesus in control. And so we see the return of the Lord in verse 26, a removal of their shame. Oh, beloved, listen, the world hates the Jewish people. We now have congresswomen who and men who say that, that uh, the Jewish people don't have the right to be in the land. We have people in our own country are determining now that the Jews are, are living on land that they stole from someone else. This is God's land. This is the Jewish land, folks. We we'll see the Bible. God says, I'll remove your shame. You don't have to be shamed of anybody anymore. Nobody will ever say anything ugly about you in my presence. In verse 27, we see the realization of their sovereign. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. This again is speaking of the kingdom. That I'll be in the midst. That means Jesus will be in Jerusalem. There he'll rule and reign from the temple area, the new temple, the fourth temple. Not the one that's going to be built soon and devastated and desolated in the time of the tribulation. But the fourth one, the, the kingdom temple, the one where Jesus will have his throne. He said, I am the Lord your God and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. 
He said, they'll, they'll love me, they'll f- believe in me, they'll, f- they'll, they'll worship me, and they'll never be put to shame. So we see a time of rescue in these first few verses. In verse 28 through 32, we see a time of restoration. A time of restoration. A prophecy is finalized in Israel in verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward. Now, what what does the word afterward lean to? What it means is the finalization of the tribulation period and Christ's return. So after the tribulation is finished, and when Jesus comes back afterward, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Now what we see here is a salvation of a people. When he says, I'll pour my spirit um, on all flesh, it means that those who are saved, those who receive Christ, will have the spirit of God. Just like you and I today, turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, the Bible says in verse 13, In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Now that's how we're saved today. When we're saved, we are, we are literally uh, baptized by the Holy Spirit. He literally comes to reside within us. The Bible says in, in uh, Romans chapter 8 that if we do not possess the Holy Spirit of God, we are none of his. That means we're not saved. And so the Holy Spirit literally comes within you. Jesus called it being born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not, Jesus said, that you must be born again. And so this pouring out of the Spirit means that the Spirit is going to be poured out upon, in this case, the Jewish people. They're going to be saved. They're going to come to know Christ as their Savior. So we see the promise of God's redemption. The promise of God's redemption. The Jewish nation will become saved. They'll receive Christ. That's why a lot of people today say the Jews are finished. God is finished with the Jew. He has turned his back on the Jew and he's taken all his promises and all his covenants and he's given it to the church. Well, folks, they've got it backwards. You see, the church is engrafted into the olive tree. We've been given these promises because we've become a part of the olive tree. We've been grafted in to the olive tree. But we see the formation of this will happen. Paul talks about it in Romans. Turn to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. We know that uh, the 10th chapter is a great chapter on being saved. But look here in, in Romans chapter 11, starting with verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Folks, what's happened is when the Jewish people as a nation rejected their Messiah, they opened it up for the whole world to receive him as their Messiah. Paul was sent out into the world to become the missionary of the Gentile nations. And therefore the gospel of Christ began to spread all through that Mediterranean area, up into Europe, down into Africa, over into Asia, all the way across the oceans into the Americas. Oh, folks, think about this. The Bible says that in, in verse 25, that there is a wiseness in part, that, that the, the Jewish people are blinded by part until all the Gentiles come in. When that last Gentile is saved, I don't know who that man or woman or young person or child is, but there is a person that God knows who they are, who that last person will be. Then the Jewish nation will have the opportunity. God will reach to their hearts and 
and they will receive Christ. Look at verse 26. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. From this, For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sin. We see here, folks, in Romans chapter 11, there is a promise of redemption of the Jewish people, and that remnant will be saved. That remnant there in uh, Petra will be saved. Then we see back in Joel chapter 2 and verse 28, the provision of God's rescue. The Bible says, I will pour out my spirit upon you. Zechariah 12, 10 says, And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they've pierced. Yes, we'll mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Those people who were in Jerusalem that will go down into Petra will see Jesus and they'll see his hands and they'll say, what are these marks in your hands? And he'll say, I got these wounds from my friends. And they'll come to know who Jesus is. That's why Jesus told them there in the Mount of Olives, I will not see you again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they will receive him as their Savior there in that time. So we see a salvation of a people. In verse 28, the Spirit of God will pour out on all the Jewish men and women there. And so we see the salvation of a people. Then we see the specifics of the prophecy. What is the demonstration of God's outpourings, plural? Now this is, has a dual outpouring. It has a dual reference for this prophecy. In fact, this prophecy was fulfilled and will be fulfilled again. It was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 in verse 1 through 4 where Paul began to speak to the men and women of Jerusalem. Turn there quickly to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, starting with verse 1. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues of as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So we see in verses 1 through 4, at Pentecost in Jerusalem, there was an outpouring. There was an outpouring. There was a dual fulfillment of this, uh, of this prophecy. The first was at the beginning of the church. It began the age of grace. It began the church age. But the church age is finished. Now we're in the kingdom age. And so we see a second outpouring will begin the thousand year reign of Christ. A second outpouring where the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And then we see the dynamics of God's outpouring. The Bible says that it's on everyone. It's on, on uh, the Bible says, upon your sons, upon your daughters. Old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And so it's not limited by who, but it's all of the Jewish people. So we'll see the dynamics of God's outpouring here in verse 28. In verse 29 through 32, we see a prophetic future in Israel. The Bible says in verse 29, we see a consummation in the, tri in the tribulation. In 29, we see the servants of redemption. The Bible says, And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. What days are in those days? That's talking about the tribulation period. Revelation chapter 7. If you'll turn there, Revelation chapter 7. The Bible shows another outpouring. Another outpouring. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 7, verse 3, the Bible says, And do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God 
on their forehead. See, that's those servants we talk about in verse 29, my manservants and my maidservants. 100, and I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Now how, and it, then it goes on in verses 5 through 8, describes how many in each tribe. Now, how were they sealed, folks? They were sealed just like the book of Ephesians says, they were sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. Now, understand that the Spirit had been removed at the rapture. Now, that's previous to the tribulation period. Now, the rapture does not start the tribulation period. There are a few months between the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation period. What begins a tribulation period is when the Jewish people sign the covenant with the Antichrist for seven years. But what we see here, folks, is that in this first half of the tribulation period, God is going to bring two witnesses in the land. Some people believe it's Enoch and Moses. Some people believe it's Enoch and, and Elisha. And folks, listen, I believe it's Enoch and Elijah because they're the two men who have never seen death. Because eventually these men are going to be killed by uh, the forces of the Antichrist and they're going to resurrect. But not before they get 144,000 Jewish evangelists. 444,000 Apostle Pauls going throughout the entire world. Millions of people will be saved and martyred, by the way. We see this great over, out, outpouring here. You see, the Spirit had been removed at the rapture for two reasons. First of all, to escort the believers home. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed into the day of redemption. You see, the Holy Spirit, when he's removed, as we see also, he is removed so that he will allow the Holy, excuse me, the Antichrist to be revealed in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, 6 and 7 says, And now we know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time, speaking of the Holy Spirit. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. So the Holy Spirit will be removed. And when is that? The rapture. And if the Holy Spirit's going to be removed, you and I are going to be removed because we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. As it says in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed until the day of redemption. So we see that great rapture, which will be a rapture and a resurrection for those who've already died. And then the Bible says there'll be a pouring out of the Spirit. They'll be sealed, these, these 144,000 believers and those who become Christians after they, after, after their, their evangelism. They'll be sealed, too, by the Holy Spirit of God. And then we see here in verse 29, these servants of redemption there. The revelation is in chapter 7, again, the messengers and martyrs. In verse 30 and 31, we see the signs of his return. Now, these are the bold judgments of Revelation chapter 16. If we had time, we'd read the whole chapter. You could see that these are talking about these bold judgments that are coming in the second half of the tribulation period. The first half of the tribulation, they have two sets of seven judgments. The judgment of the, of the, 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 the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments. But the last half of the tribulation will be the Seven bold judgments. And we see that here in verse 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. We see here in verse 30 and 31. He said, I'll show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. That's the second coming of Christ, that, that awesome day of the Lord. And so we see that there will become these, these signals, these signs that these people will see, but they won't be ready. There'll be those who take the mark of the beast and their lives will be eternally changed. The Bible says once you receive that mark, once you take the mark of the beast, you can never be saved. And so we see its consummation of the tribulation period. Verse 32, we see its completion in the, in the kingdom. And it shall come to pass 
that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. We see the Bible says that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord, salvation will be granted. Turn to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. We see in verse 37 through 39. Matthew 23, 37 through 39. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets. This is Jesus speaking there on the Mount of Olives overlooking uh, Jerusalem. Who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I've wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall, not, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You see, that's when whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved there in those last days of the tribulation. The Bible says, they that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There will be many people, millions of people who receive Christ during the tribulation but will be martyred. And there will be a remnant in the last days that will receive Christ. We see, beloved, very carefully in verse 32, a salvation is granted. But a Savior is glorified. The King has come. From Mount Zion in Jerusalem there should be deliverance. Jesus is going to come to Jerusalem after he goes down and takes care of the, of the forces down there that are trying to kill the Jews in Petra. He'll come back to Jerusalem and free that city from its influence of the Antichrist. And then we see a survivor's grace. The Bible says that the Lord has said among the remnant who the Lord calls. We see survivor's grace. Jesus is still seeking to save. Even in the latter part of the tribulation, even all during the tribulation, he's still seeking those who receive Christ. Oh, the tribulation period is a bad time, but oh, beloved, there'll come a time when it ends, only seven years. And at its conclusion, we're going to see a beautiful time, a time of God's glory, a time of God's grace, a time of God's majesty. We will see the king in all his glory. We will come to rule and reign with him. But there is that time, that time called Jacob's trouble, that the Bible teaches us that is a horrible time that comes on the face of the earth, but it's not forever. Satan will not win. Jesus will endure. Jesus will prevail. In verse 30, chapter 30 of Jeremiah, verse 7 through 9, the Bible says very simply, at last for that day is great, so that none is like it. And it is a time of Jacob's trouble, speaking of the Jewish people. But he shall be saved out of it, that remnant will be saved. For it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from your neck, and I will burst your bonds. Foreigners shall no more enslave them but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Oh, beloved, we see here that the kingdom is going to be a place where the Jewish people will no longer be enslaved. They'll serve David once more. They will serve Jesus again, and they will have that time of eternal bliss for a thousand years. Oh, beloved, I'm looking forward to it. How about you? I believe it is as real as today. I believe it is as real as, as seven years from now, if the Lord would return today. I believe Jesus is going to establish his kingdom. Let's pray. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. 
Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday. Let's be